it's like Lynn said a while ago oh. that she'd never heard the milk and bread but she came to Alabama. <laughs> yeah, Rachel says she lives in God's zone. She's really in the South. So anyway, this is uh, the, the spiritual gifts class is lesson number seven. And this was a good one this week, I think. Yeah. Yes, Rachel is locked down again. Tell us about it, Rachel. Oh, yes. Three people have got it and they don't know how they got it because it can't be connected to the border for some reason. So we've apparently it'll be lifted on Wednesday night, but it might be longer and i hope not because we're supposed to be going away on thursday <laughs> so you can't go outside at all oh no it's lockdown three which means that um you stay home as much as possible so work from home you can go to the supermarket um but you're not allowed to travel outside of auckland so they've got police all around the border wow yeah, I read an article on it, I guess, yesterday because they implemented this Sunday and it was like, I can't remember the phraseology that was used, but it was like a, an instant lockdown, a sudden lockdown, don't move. Then I went, oh, me, that's sort of harsh, you know? So yeah. anyway, well, let me pray for us and then uh, we'll jump right in here. And I'm going to ask David and Shirley what they were talking about with this lesson, okay? Because I have a feeling it's going to be really, really good. So Father, I do thank you for this time together. And uh, exactly what Jim was talking about a while ago, Lord, just a blessing that you have given us uh, of literally friends all about the world and uh, of knitting together your body in, in such an unusual way. We thank you for that. We praise you for it. Uh, Lord, I do pray for Rachel and her family. I pray that they will be able to go off on a holiday. And everything will be set free Wednesday and they'll be able to get off to celebrate a birthday and just for a time of refreshing. Uh, Lord, I pray that for all of us. Some of us are sort of locked up right now because it's just icing outside, uh, that we would seize those moments and those times of uh, sort of forced quietness and forced solitude and a change of pace, uh, very special moments. And we thank you for those seasons. And so, Lord, I just pray that, uh, that each one of us will just listen very aggressively for what you have to say to us. Uh, we do thank you for the continued time that you give us in your word. And uh, uh, Lord, for the things that you showed us this week. Uh, Lord, I thank you especially for the, um, what, the questions, the things that come to our mind. Uh, so often we sit there and we've experienced something the entire life and all of a sudden we see something in the scripture and we go, wait a minute, why do we do this when the word says this? Is there, is there an inconsistency? Is there a problem? And Lord, about how you just graciously place your fingers on things uh, in our lives personally and our Life corporately is your body. And I, I thank you for that, Lord, because I know that you are uh, stirring, Lord, that you are purifying, that you're doing just wondrous things in and through us. And we just ask that you continue doing that. So, Lord, continue to show us your truth now this evening. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So uh, uh, what we all study on this week as far as uh, these lists of what I guess call spirituals, spiritual gifts. What did you look at? Leadership, administrations, gifts, givings. Yeah, yeah. So uh, David had mentioned, and David and Shirley right here in our little Hollywood squares, they are a husband and wife. They've been married some, I want to say 63 years, but I'm not sure if it's that 61. long. 61. There we go. 61 years. And so uh, they know each other. And so when they study this stuff, they talk about it all the time. Right, guys? And mm -hmm. so what was it y'all were talking about related to this? Well, I didn't have a problem with anything until I got to the leaders part and the administration part. At, and um, I looked at it from a biblical view and I looked at it from a worldview. And I have some issues when it comes to church leadership. Yo. <laughs> uh-huh. I do. I just turned off my poker face right there. So, okay. Okay. I have a problem with that because I'm old school and I feel like that women have a place in the church. Yes, they do. Personally, I'm going to get in trouble with the, my church probably, but I do not think that a lady, a woman should be 
a minister of the gospel. I don't have a problem with her being a teacher. I don't have a problem with any of those leadership roles as long I don't think we need to, I think men need to step up and do what the men are supposed to do in the church and the women won't have to. Much thanks. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, we got three amens from the second row on my screen up here, okay? <laughs> hey, you know, this is actually very good because last week in our lesson, we actually had a segment on it with women teaching, remember? and shepherding yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. And we didn't say we didn't say anything about it here in uh, this class, uh, not by intention. And then, uh, you know, I do two local sessions of the same course um, tomorrow. And in the morning class, nobody said anything about it. In the night class, nobody said anything about it to the very end. And we were leaving, they said, oh, I was hoping we'd talk about this. And I went, oh, I, you know, I, it just never crossed my mind. Then I found out that somebody in the online class here had said something about it uh, in the chat, and I totally missed it. I, I didn't. So I wanted to remind y'all: if you if you ask a question about something in the chat and I don't say anything about it, that generally means I didn't see it. <laughs> so make that sure was, you bring it up was, again. That was me. Okay, I never saw it, and so it. But it, I thought, you know, I need to cover that and touch on that, uh, you know, in all three of these things. And but here we go. It, it happens very naturally in God's timing and in God's way. So uh, anyway, um, so what do y'all say about that? I got three right here saying that, you know, agreeing with what Shirley said. Lynn, what do you say? Lynn's got some special insights into this. Well, it depends on what they're agreeing with. They may have been agreeing with the part of the men need to step up. Yes. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, uh, I'm just going to keep that to myself. <laughs> I always go to first, I always go to First Timothy three, chapter three. Uh -huh. What does uh, it say? Because it well, it says you know a uh, faithful to his wife, and right. uh, things like that, and and uh, so it's always his, his, his. So I don't know. Oh, I got you. So it's always like a man being spoken of right there. I think women have capabilities of doing anything they want to do. And I think they can, um, I think that I just feel like the church, the church should be led by a man and a woman should be there to, I think the leader of the church should be the person that says, we need this done or we want that done or we're gonna stand in the, in the pew, I mean, in the pulpit and we're gonna preach the word. But I believe that the woman any woman should be able to administrate what needs to be done without standing up and preaching to the congregation. That's just a personal opinion. But women are capable of teaching. They can teach. And, well, that's just my opinion. I won't say anything else. Well, let's, let's go beyond that because I can mess with Shirley on this because I love her and she loves me. Uh, Beyond our opinion, what does the scripture say about it? Well, it, one thing it says, it, Paul was talking about imitate me and then imitate yes. Christ. Uh-huh. Right. And I just have a problem with this. I really do. So. Mm -hmm. um, now, I wonder why, what, what, what's the problem? And work with me here, Shirley. I'm just using you as an example because I okay, so appreciate Okay, I'll you. use you as an example. No, I, I appreciate you, you know, bringing it up. Uh, you know that what, I'm pretty plain and tell you what I think pretty much. Yeah. Okay, look what Rachel just said. What's the difference between preaching and teaching? Both can be done in the pulpit and in home and on the street, right? And then uh, Kimmy, was it Kimberly? Oh, Kimberly says, I don't think women are supposed to be over men. So what y'all saw last week? was that they are not to do what? A woman is not to, you, was it have authority over a man? And when you looked up those scriptures last week, what was the relationship between the woman and the man? Wasn't the scripture husband that wife. a woman shouldn't husband teach a man? Wife. I thought it was talking about husband and wife. It's husband and wife. It's yeah. husband and wife. Okay, 
and is speaking to the governmental structure within the family. And so surely is not to exert authority from the point of view uh, uh, that is unnatural and outside the Bible over her husband, David. Okay. Now, a lot of people will use that to defend and say, okay, that means that a woman can be the pastor of the church. And it, the, the terminology that Shirley was using a while ago is very, very useful to some points I want to make. Okay. And uh, because I think the issue isn't so much the husband and the wife or the man and the woman. I think the biggest problem is that we're not structured governmentally correctly from the get-go. Because show me anywhere in the scripture where it says that the church is to be led by one man. You can't find that, but based on what Shirley said a while ago, uh -huh. if there were not female preachers, I guess about 40% of our students yeah. are female for course of study. And if you start any part-time local pastors, but if you start looking at the ones who are in churches who are elders, and the problem is they're begging now for people to come fill a pulpit because they don't have enough. Yeah. Now, why is that? Well, I don't know. It's like Robert told me the other day, I think he said 10 United Methodist preachers in our conference are retiring this year. We have two new ones coming into licensing school. Right. Mm -hmm. So we need eight more just to fill those 10 that are leaving. Yeah. So why is I, that? I think my problem is more than anything. I don't <laughs> see the man, men, and I'm talking about the church in general. I don't see them stepping up to their role yeah. in the church. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, hey, you're dealing with trouble here and I know it. No, no, no. You're not. You think you're going to get in trouble. Wait till I get done. And, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> with, with all these things, when you hear what I think, because it's really what the scripture says, folks, with the scripture, what you see is a plurality of leadership within the church. Okay. And people lead according to their gifts and the callings that God has. It's the plurality of leadership. And a lot of the problems that we have is that we play, and we've talked about this before, we place it all on one position and one thing. And you don't see that anywhere in the scripture. And it literally sets up a church to fail. It literally sets up a, an individual to fail, okay? And so it's not only this thing, okay, is it man or woman? Is what we're doing correct? And I would submit to you uh, that it's not, okay? That it's not at all. And so, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example of my son-in-law, Aaron. And uh, he and I, we've been talking about this stuff for 15 or 16 years. He's actually implementing it in the church. He is the, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, he would never call himself this, but we would understand him to be the senior pastor, okay? And uh, they've got a staff now. They've got, uh, uh, how was, I think they've been meeting five years now. They've got 400 people in the church. And they've got uh, a couple full-times, two or three part-times, this kind of stuff. But when it comes to leadership, they're all equal. There's a level of administrative, surely what you were talking about a while ago, okay? But then there's also a group of guys and, uh, and some ladies, too, that give input into the body, and they pray together, and they meet together, and they talk. There's a group of guys, that three or four, that are sort of been raised up the last two or three years, and they share preaching responsibility. And so they'll come along and have a, a, a series or a subject matter or something like that that they're going to be uh, uh, covering. And Aaron showed me, I was over there Christmas, and I think the first three months of this year, he's preaching three times. He's going to be in a pulpit three times. The other guys will be there preaching. He's not going to be out of town. He's going to be on the front row, and he's encouraging them. And they meet together and they study together and they have a mind together about what the Lord is saying to their body. What do you think would happen to most churches if, 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 uh, if they came back and they started approaching that way? What would they say about uh, the pastor, as we call it? Not doing his job. We kick them out. 
Yeah, exactly. He's not doing his job, not in the pulpit enough, not in this kind of stuff. No, you're raising up. He's raising up people and actually sending them out. You know, you raise up and you equip. And so uh, I think the greater problem is at that level. And it actually comes to this leadership stuff, okay, that we looked at. And uh, I'm going to get to these things I was saying right here in the uh, chat. We're not going to forget that. But I, I sort of want to lay a foundation with this because I think a lot of it does go to this. Even the way that the precept lesson was done this week, it touched upon leadership, but it was primarily the scripture you looked upon leadership was related to who? You know, you looked up the scripture passages that had the qualifications and all that, and it was talking about who? Are you talking about like overseer? Or you're talking about yeah, like yeah, person? exactly, about yeah, man? yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It was the oh, it was the overseer and the elders. Yeah, what were you saying, Hilda? Who else? I said overseer, but yeah, it's, it's the over. Uh, I I don't know. I've always, I guess, I had it wrong about the overseer being the one that oversees the whole church. I didn't consider it as a uh, another thing, you know. Yeah. Well, no, it, it could be anything. It's it not defined. It was, it was, it was, no. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's not defined. You see how it functions a little bit. You see that Paul would go in the area and share the gospel, and then he would come back, and he would uh, uh, tell Timothy, hey, you know, uh, place somebody in charge of this gathering, this gathering, this gathering. And Timothy would go in there and seek the Lord and watch and see what was going on, and the leadership would define itself. The tendency we have is we want to go out and we want to get a hired gun, one individual to come in and do certain things. And so through the last two or 300 years, we've really sort of got ourselves in a leadership mess over this kind of stuff. And so uh, they used a lot of that as an example, as a spiritual gift of leading. And I think they actually made a statement either in the homework or you know, somewhere else I was reading uh, with the precept stuff that uh, someone in these positions need to, needs to have the spiritual gift of leading. And I thought, you know, I'm not too sure I agree with that, uh, of the overseers and the elders, because there's some, I, I've been in a church where we had elders and the elders led, and there's various degrees, and the leading doesn't always come about in the same kind of way uh, that people think this is automatically uh, behind the pulpit kind of thing, but it's not. Now, let me shut up and go back up here to see what y'all were saying about the uh, uh, the women and the wives and this thing. Uh, uh, Kimberly says something, um, and Carol said it. The, the, the Greek uh, with the husband of one wife kind of thing, it literally means this. It means a one-woman man. A one-woman man. Someone whose mind, whose focus and attention is upon the one woman. Now, a lot of times people make fun of that. They'll say something like, oh, one at a time, man. <laughs> no, no, no. But we come along and we draw lines of demarcation that are, are far, far outside what the Bible says. Like there's major um, people that you would know if I mentioned their names right now. They're great preachers. They write tons of books, this kind of stuff. And they are absolutely convinced that if someone is divorced, that they cannot shepherd a church and they can't lead the church, even if that divorce took place before the time they were saved. I mean, it's literally like the unpardonable sin. Southern I mean, Baptist. literally. Yes, yeah, Jim. Southern Baptist. Uh, a lot are. Not all, but a lot are. Okay. And then there's a lot of other ones that are hard, more hard nosed than even that, you know. Uh, Kimberly said they went to war over whether the deacons at the old church, if a woman could be in a deacon. Well, see, in most, particularly Baptist churches, the way the deacons are structured and the role of the deacons, that's totally unbiblical. It, the, the deacons are not a, uh, a board. And a lot of the good churches are realizing that. And, and they're trying to get to where the, uh, the deacons are functioning as they should be. And deacon just means servant, okay? So uh, the, the thing with that, the husband of one wife, does that mean that... Um, someone who's in this role of leadership or the overseer or the elder, that means they have to be married. What if they're not married? Can you be an overseer and elder if you're not married? Yes. 
<laughs> Thank you, Lynn, for that hesitant answer right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, uh, I mean, I ran into it. Just speaking for me personally, I remember being 23 and 24 and 25 years old, and churches would not talk to me because I was single. Now, they would talk to the guy that was 25 years old that had been married for five years and had two kids because they considered him to be more mature. You know, but they wouldn't. I mean, I ran into many churches that, no, no, you have to be married. You have to do this. You have to do that. And so, you know, that's fine. You can, but it's not biblical. Uh, was Paul married? Probably was. Yeah, he probably was because he's a Pharisee. And I think they yeah. had to be married. So uh, a lot of times people say, well, Paul wasn't married. So what do you think is going on there? Maybe oh, sure. like, yeah. He didn't spend well, much time with her if he was married. <laughs> yeah. He didn't do real good, did he? We don't know. The answer is we don't know. And that's a great answer, folks. We're not told. So don't, you know, you can have conjecture. You can have fun with it. But we're not told. More than likely, uh, she might have died. We simply don't know, okay? Paul does make comments. I, you know, I wish that you would be more like I am, you know, like this. And he was speaking of the fact that he was single and celibate probably. But that's probably not how he was at the beginning. So, uh, you know, where does this leave us with all this kind of thing? Uh, you look at several examples of leadership in, in the uh, homework. Uh, uh, who's the ultimate leader, obviously? The perfect example of leading. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is a perfect example, and he led the people. And how did he lead them? I, you, you know, you look at the scripture passage, washing the feet. Okay, that's good. What's that a picture of? Servant. Love. Yeah, servant. Love. Humility. Knowing that his creation enjoys a good foot rub. Yeah. No, you, you see that humility? You see that? Uh, you looked up Peter. I'm sorry, Laura, what? Setting an example. Set an example. Uh, Y'all looked up Peter. What about Peter? Did Peter have a, a gift of leading? Called him a fellow elder. Called him fellow elder. So he was an elder. Uh, so, Lynn, is an elder the same as someone who's a leader? See, I'm going to draw Lynn into this, whether she wants to or not. You have to. You have to start looking at the at the the Greek and and doing your word studies. And the answer yes. is yes. They were yes. all the, basically the same thing. Yeah, and they, but they're not what we make them to be. No. And I think that's the big no. problem that we run into, you know. And also, when you come along, this was the thing that was striking me about this homework. And I, I'm, you know, I'm just getting really aware and sensitive of so much of this kind of stuff, maybe too much so sometimes. Uh, but when you're doing homework like this and you see his leadership and you're looking at overseer and you're looking at elder and you're looking at all this kind of stuff, most of us are factoring ourselves out of that calling. And we're thinking, okay, I, I don't really, God doesn't want to move within leadership within me. At the very end of the lesson, they may say something like, oh, <coughs> that, the precept people actually said this. The, let me get that. Let me see what it was in their study helps. Where did I put that? Here it is. They said that elders and overseers and pastors are only some of the gift of leading. After going through all this stuff, then they come on, you know, people, women who head up women's missionary things or other ministries are also examples of leaders in the body. Well, no joke, you know, but the thing is you focus all your attention to one particular thing and don't really bring out the fact, if you go look at the Old Testament, there's tons and tons of example of leadership that wasn't the top leadership in Israel. Even in the New Testament, you have the same type of thing. Uh, yeah, well, you have examples like what Laura just put up, you know, Lottie Moon, people that have led and things like that. And so uh, from the point of view of elders and overseers, yeah, women were probably factored out from that, from what we've seen, though... There is some hint in the scripture of a, of a woman that might have been an apostle that was sent, for, sent forth. There's more than a hint in the scripture of uh, the church that met in a woman's house and she was the leader of that church in that house. Our problem is we want to come along, we want to give them a title, and we want to say this and that. And it goes back to what Shirley said at the beginning. I want to go us, back to what um, yeah. Laura Ray always says. We put a really small box and try to stick God in it. 
I like that every time yeah. you say I'm lost. Yeah, and, and that's the truth. That's <laughs> what we do. And it's like we want to um, we want to say, okay, if we've got our rules defined just right, then our leadership would be just right. <laughs> and nothing can be further from the truth. Because what you see with leaders is you see them move in humility. Well, let me go back here. So you saw Peter. Uh, you saw Paul as an example. Is, did Paul have leadership, you think? Are you saying it was Paul a leader? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in a different kind of way. Okay. So Rachel says, what gets me is the rules of what happens in the church building on a Sunday morning is different from life Monday is outside the building. Ah! Well, there you go. That's, you know, that's probably a really sweet definition of hypocrites, right? In terms of where women fit. Yeah. We, we really are very, very consistent. And so I actually had a problem with them. You know, um, the way that the lesson was sort of structured and how they tied the elders and overseer into leader and made it sort of look like that that's the primary thing. I thought it was like an unnecessary leap. And then they asked, came on and made the comment that, you know, everybody who has is an elder overseer should have the gift of leadership. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I would say it exactly that way. But then if you come in and tie it in, what were some of the... Um, characteristics of those that were overseers and elders. You know how y'all read a couple of scripture passages that had all the, uh, uh, what they need to be. What were some of those things? Just fire them off at me. Able oh, to teach. Able to teach, good. Respectable. Respectable, yeah. Good it talks about having a good reputation outside. Good reputation outside, church. yeah. Mm -hmm. Managing his own family. <laughs> Manages the home family, right. Not a new not, convert. Not a new convert, not a drunkard, not violent, hospitable. Mm -hmm. What do y'all think when you look at that list like that? It's a... You know what crossed my mind? It's hard to feel it. <laughs> I looked at that and I went, you know, I'm not sure if Peter Paul qualify. Because guess what? Both of them didn't have a good reputation outside both of them messed up like what did peter do denied the lord yet not a lover of money that's a big i say the temperate part both of them had a temper yeah yeah <laughs> it does doesn't it rachel <laughs> the hillsong guy yeah that kind of stuff happens all the time it's sad but here's what happens we come along but well, we'll get that list and then you'll get somebody in there and they check off all the boxes and they look great and they look wonderful but the state of their heart is a dark heart I'd rather have somebody that's truly actually saved, born again, in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and doing what he wants them to do, who might from time to time mess up and say something wrong and do something wrong. So it's not the idea of that this person checks off in every way has never done anything like this. As a matter of fact, there's another scripture passage that says, beware when all men speak well of you. Remember that? Yeah. And what happened with Peter? Jesus actually looked at Peter and told him, he says, hey, after you're restored, you lead these guys right here. He was telling him he was going to mess up before he messed up, before he denied him. Yeah, and there's tears among the wheat. Yeah, Laura, same thing. So, and then at the end of the lesson, you know, uh, Peter, Paul both warned about there being false teachers, false prophets, false leaders. There's going to be things like that all the time. I would ask if any of y'all have ever experienced a false leader before but we don't have the rest of the day. And, and Laura's face right there just told it all. And, and Hilda's, Hilda's sweet little wise smile of the ages right there. We've all been there, haven't we? So what do you do with somebody like that? Uh, you bring them before the Lord. I mean, there's some right now that I know, I just you know, bring before the Lord and say, Lord, save them. I know God wants them to be saved and I hope they do. You know, you pray for them. That's exactly it. So, uh, you saw in the scripture that Paul gave Timothy some instructions about this, you know, of, uh, you know, not receiving a charge against somebody in leadership unless there's a couple of witnesses. I don't think that's a bad principle for anybody. Because I got news for you. We're all in leadership in some way or another. Okay. But then there's a the spiritual empowering of leadership. We think it's automatically associated with leading the church. Maybe it's automatically associated with leading people in the world. You know, we just automatically think that. 
But then he said, don't lay hands too hastily on anyone. What does that mean? Don't put him in leadership too hastily. Yeah, why is that? You don't know their hearts. You have to watch them and watch their fruit. Yeah. So and how do you... The same thing as a new convert. They're immature. Okay. You want to see where they are. Yeah, yeah. I got to tell you the story about my friend Rick. And I, I've shared this a couple times before. And Rick was just, just a great guy. I love him to death. Uh, he, he's, st he's still around. He lives up uh, many, many states away from us now. But uh, we've prayed for Rick for years. He wasn't saved. His wife was in our choir. Loved her to death. She actually died a couple of years ago. And uh, very unexpectedly, just, just with the sweetest thing. And so we prayed for Rick and prayed for Rick. He came to church several times. And then he would just quit, you know. Rick got saved on a Friday night when he was at home, drunk and half stoned. And he said this, God, if you're real, will you change my life? I want to take a guess about what happened to him? <laughs> and sober. He was sober instantly. And it was so funny because we prayed for him for years. And me and my buddy Ron had, had started the church. We'd left this Baptist church and we started the church. And we're meeting at a school. And that next Sunday, we're at this portable cafeteria building. And Rick walks in the back door. And, of course, Ron and I look at each other and say, hey, what's Rick Thompson doing here? <laughs> you know, you've been praying for him for years. He walks in the door, right? And, man, God just, he did. He cleaned him up, man. It's just, And he just flourished in the Lord. We thought that he was supposed to be in a leadership position. But it was sort of soon, whatever soon is. Now, Rick was in his mid-40s then, okay? He was an adult, man. And uh, so we, we weren't sure. And we had this other guy, and I've mentioned it several times, John, who had just been saved. And from the beginning, you, John had a prophetic gift upon him, unlike any I've, I've really experienced from anybody. And so uh, Ron and I, I told Ron, I said, I'm going to ask John to pray about whether Rick's supposed to be in leadership, but I'm not going to tell him anything about it. He said, okay, let's do that. So I called John. I said, hey, John, I want you to pray about something. He said, okay, what? I said, I'm not telling you. I just want you to pray about it and then see if God tells you anything or reveals anything to you. He said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, he, man, he's eager. He's all excited. Two or three days later, I remember it was on a Friday. He called me. He says, hey, I was praying about that thing you told me about. I said, yeah. He, I said, what? he said, I saw something and he would see things. He would have visions. He said, I saw a lady and she was up in a tower, like in that, uh, Fairy tale thing with a lady that lifts her hair out to get down. Which one is that, Laura? Uh, is it Rapunzel? Or? Yeah. It, it, it was like that. And he said, she's looking out one window, and it's a big window, and it's everything that she's ever wanted in the world. It's beautiful out there. It's a big window. She can get out, let her hair down, go out that way. She looks out another window, and there's her husband. And when he said that, I knew what it meant. And I'm just going, oh, my. Thank you, Lord. And uh, so he kept talking. He says, do you know what it means? I said, well, what else? Because I didn't want to tell him because, and those kind of things, the more you think about it, the more you talk about it, the more you pray about it, the more that's revealed a lot of times. And he says, well, he says, she wants to be with her husband, but the wind is too small and she can't get out the window that way. But over here's everything she's wanted out this big window. She could go that way, but she can't fit in this window over here. And then all of a sudden he went, she needs to humble herself to where she'll fit in the wind to where she can get to her husband. I said, yeah. He says, what does that mean? I said, I don't know, but that's, that's what that means. I don't, you know. So I told Ron about it. This is on a Friday. Sunday at church, we just had times. It was just very free. And Rick just stood up and he says, I just want to thank the Lord. Because my wife came to me this week and humbled herself before me. He literally used that phrase. Mm -hmm. Ron and I are just standing up there going, we're looking at each other. Well, there we go. Because, I mean, we, we knew her, loved her death. She's a believer and everything. But we, you know, when someone is called into that position, it's not only them, but it's their wife too, their spouse, right? And we knew that he was supposed to do that because we felt it. And then we asked God to, we prayed about it. Ask someone who didn't know, the Lord revealed it to him, and he just flourished in that. And, you know, he was just, uh, he still is, he's still alive. Very compassionate, 
very soft spoken, not someone that you would think would be a massive pulpiteer or anything like that, but led in a, in just a, a powerful, powerful way. I think a lot of times that we get distracted by what we see in the flesh rather than what God's wanting to reveal in the spirit when it comes to leadership. And, uh, and I think there's actually a lot more of us that the Lord wants to use within the arena, the arena of leadership, but we get distracted by uh, all these other things that we've been talking about. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, with that being said, is there a difference between the gift of leadership and the gift of administration? Y'all looked at that this week. Shirley brought up an interesting thing while ago when she was starting, and she said something at the beginning. Are they the same gift? Are they two second gifts? Or does it matter? <laughs> number one, I think it doesn't matter. But number two, I do think there are nuances that make them two different things. Right. Yeah. I think they are two different things. So what are the differences then? Without attempting to do you know, here's column A, here's column B. No. Okay, Rachel says, uh, administration puts into action what the leader decides. Yeah. I'm uh, oh, sorry, what? I just said I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's what you said. Yeah. Yeah, now, Tanya, a lot of times people come along and they will say exactly that. Okay, Tanya, I want to mess with you on this one because you, you brought it up. That's great. That's a question that I was always asked in, uh, in different situations in previous times in our life. People would always come, they would say this thing, what is your vision for the church? And I had to be so careful because people are usually very, very sincere about that question. And I know exactly what they're trying to say. But to me, that's one of the most irritating questions ever. Because why would I want the vision of man about the church? What is the vision of God for the church? What does the Lord say? And he lays it out in his word, you know? Uh, yeah, you looked up those words, Rachel's pointing out, that sets the course, the pilot, remember the words that was like the, the captain of the ship kind of thing? And that, that's very useful, very, very useful. But there again is the idea that the ultimate leader is the most high God, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So our role in functioning is to seek his mind and know what his mind is. And I think if we do the leadership right, we find out that Laura may be leading one arena of something and then a Tanya may be leading in something else and Jim's leading in something else. And that we all, uh, somebody else says, you know, I know how to pull that off administrative. <laughs> you know, I know how to do that thing. You have the skills that the Lord is doing. And this goes beyond the skills of uh, in the natural. Remember that this is the spirit empowering people uh, to do this, to be able to implement things. And so uh, now Lynn, the reason I, I, I uh, I find Lynn's situation so interesting because this is what her life has been. Lynn, you've been there where you've been the administrator to do things and you have submitted yourself into a leadership role under somebody without seeking to usurp their authority. Am I correct on that? That's true. Even if I thought they were an idiot. And, and, no, you've never had that thought, have you? <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you, Lynn, Lynn and I, Lynn and I, and I've told you all this, we served for a very brief period of time. It's just for a year. Uh, and it was at First Baptist here locally, a great church. I love the church, love the people. Laura goes to church there. Um, it's a wonderful church. I mean, we've got so many wonderful portions of the body of Christ here. And this one is. And we were on a staff together. So we experienced things like that. And it was a great staff at that time. All of us could sit there and literally go to each other and say, um, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know, I'm not quite sure about this, but you know that you had a common heart. It was a heart of the kingdom, but it's not always that way. But Lynn is a woman who was in that role in functioning, working with children and people always go, okay, we don't have a problem with the women working with children, but you finished your career where Lynn, I don't even know what your official title was. Were you like a I was minister of I was minister of education and administration. So Church let me tell you what that means. I'll tell you what okay. let me tell you what that is from my side. That is uh, that position deals with everything that the senior pastor doesn't want to deal with. That is it basically it. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a malicious way. That is just a job mm -hmm. description. I mean that's it. That and to uh, me is what an administrator is, is taking forth something that needs to be done and sees that it is completed 
Mm -hmm. The vision we learn from God, his example. Jesus is our example. Yep. We've got some fine teachers at, at St. Andrews. Hilda uh -huh. is a wonderful teacher. Yep. Denise Snails is a wonderful teacher. Uh, Laurel Ray is a good teacher. I have no problem with these teachers. I do not. But they do not try to go in and tell the pastor what to do and how to do it either. Yeah. And, and, a lot of, and a lot of times it's the mindset. Okay. It's the mindset. Uh, uh, let me, I'll just give you another example from our life because I mean, this just speaks so to me. Uh, one of the godless women I've ever known was my secretary in South Florida. I come out of seminary. I go to this church. It's a big Baptist church down there. And uh, like I said, she was my secretary. She's 20 years older than me, at least. Yeah, right around 20. And she had just got off the mission field. She uh, had uh, had had an interesting life. I'm not even sure how many times she'd been married, several times. And then she got saved uh, later on in life. And I mean, just transformed. She'd gone off to a volunteer missionary thing. She comes back. She's working at a church. Well, in a very brief period of time, she felt like that she was supposed to go to seminary. I thought she was sort of crazy because she was old. She was like 50. <laughs> yeah, y'all know what I mean. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, oh no, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to announce I'm going to seminary tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, wait, wait till, wait till I get to the end of it. And uh, so she does. She goes to the yeah. seminary I went to. Goes to, Now, she didn't have a four-year degree. You have to have a four-year degree to go to seminaries. But they have, uh, Baptists are, Southern Baptists are great with this. If you feel like you're called into uh, doing this, they have another school. It's called Boys. That's a name. B-O-Y-C-E. It's named after a 19th century guy. And you can go there and you have basically the same courses, same professors. Uh, and you get a certificate. You don't get uh, an you know, it's because of the academic kind of stuff. Well, she went there and she enrolled in boys, but she also started taking classes over in the seminary side. This is before computers, so nobody called her. She called me, one, seriously, she called me one day. She said, you're not going to believe what I did. She did all the work for boys. She did all the work for the seminary, a three-year master's of divinity degree with the Greek and the Hebrew, everything, straight A's. Then she goes before the faculty of the seminary and petitions them to confer upon her the Masters of Divinity. There's no reason to petition it. She earned it. They all thought that she was an MDiv candidate. And she wasn't. She was actually pastoring two American Baptist churches across the river in Indiana. And, uh, somewhat liberal churches, but you know she was just part-time kind of things on Sunday morning. And uh, so she graduates and she wanted to I mean, she was going to be a pastor of the church and this kind of thing. And there was no door that opened to her. She'd left the places where she was. She did this. She went back to Florida. And this kind of she told me several years later, she says, you know what? She said, I was really wrong in the way I was pursuing that because, and, it's, and she's just sweetest thing. I learned more about praying from this woman than you'd ever imagine. I mean, just, you wouldn't believe. And, uh, but she said, my, I was just wrong in my motivation. She wanted to prove that a woman could do this. You know what I'm saying? And that a woman belonged in the pulpit, et cetera, et cetera. She said, I was just wrong in the way I went about it. And 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 she she really repented over that. Hey, Hilda, she went back to school. And about three years ago, I think at the age of 82, finished her doctorate. <laughs> you know, she she just loves learning oh, about God. That, that's, an, that's good. <laughs> yeah. But the we big thing was. We had a lady when I was in high school, she was uh, 63 and she was getting her high school education. And uh, it was amazing what she had most interesting questions, you know. Oh, yeah. Life. And it was I was a, it was she was a joy to be. with. Don't you just honor that, respect that. you know, And you do. But I, I just love the fact that she she realized, wait a minute, you know, I, I was a little sideways there. Uh, on my motivation, you know, and, and we've all been there and done that. Now, quickly, because our time's flying, what did y'all learn about giving? There's a spiritual gift of giving. The last four pages this week were very enlightening. I loved her letter. Oh, yeah. It. What? Yeah. Okay. The letter's great. Yeah. Why did you like it? It just made you think about things. You know, 
I told Peggy the other day that I'm going to quit clicking on anything that is religious because it automatically gives them your email address. And the first thing you get back from them is we need your help. We need a donation. Or we want to <laughs> give you a book, but we need $80 to get that book. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Hey, would it would it shock y'all or surprise y'all if I told you that I had a problem with the letter in some places? Well, no, in some places, yeah, yeah. but the overall. Sometimes. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I I I, I loved it. I, I, as a matter of fact, I think I actually received that letter. You know, because she said it was one that she'd sent out to, you know, teachers and supporters. I had no problem with it, but uh, it, it's a twofold thing. Rachel's touching upon one of them right here. It's not just the money you saw the scripture passages where Paul said, we imparted our lives to you. If you, yeah. every one of us, the most precious thing we have going for us right now is the time we got left. Right. And so when yeah. you impart life to somebody and you give life to somebody, that is so important. But then also, even within that letter, so much of our giving is structured around organizational activity. Just what Jim was saying, religious activity. We don't have the mindset that if you're standing there getting groceries or if you're getting gas or if you're just walking through life and you're looking over there, we don't have the mindset to receive from the Lord that, hey, you're supposed to give to that individual. Uh, the guy that wrote, I can't remember his name, uh, the prayer of Jabez, uh, yeah. that dude, his, as a matter of fact, his brother-in-law and I were on staff together. Yeah, Bruce Wilkinson. Thank you. Yeah, Bruce Wilkinson. One of the coolest guys you'll ever meet. He's written another book several years back, but he felt like God told him uh, to stick a hundred dollar bill in his pocket. He walks around all the time with a hundred dollar bill in his pocket and just waiting for God to tell him who needs it, who to give it to. <laughs> yeah, just to keep that mindset, whether it's a, a dollar or a penny or like the disciples and say, hey, you know what? Silver and gold have we none, but what we do have we're going to give to you. And they reach down and grab him and pull him up and he's healed. Rachel lives down in where they don't have cash anymore. <laughs> so, so what do you get? <laughs> you give them your card, you give them whatever. <laughs> no, but the idea is twofold. Yes, you meet the needs of others, Sadly, in my upbringing, my background, it never crossed a mind. I never heard a teaching on it, never heard anything about just giving wherever you see your eyes. And the great phrase you see in scripture is casting their gaze. That's what happened with those two disciples. They cast their gaze upon somebody. It was nearly in the way I was, it wasn't said this way, but generally speaking, what's communicated is if you give and if it's not given through a local church in a particular kind of way that it doesn't count in the eyes of God. And I think that that is something very detrimental to us in the way that we give and how we're supposed to be given. So what when did you I was learn? Reading, to... When I was reading all of this, it immediately was obvious to me that this is not talking about giving to the church at all, the gift of giving. <laughs> right. That when you start looking at what you, the tithe and those kind of things, that has nothing to do with the gift of giving. But what I did see two things is that you give sacrificially the gift of giving and you mm -hmm. give out of your, uh, liberally out of your excess. They used a different word, but right now I can't think. Abundance. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that when you give sacrificially, the example they have is you have two tunics, you <laughs> give somebody one. Sure. And you keep one. To me, that's yeah. a little bit sacrificial but that's part of it. Then other, you, you give out of your abundance. And so to me, I was seeing this and like you just said, um, so often in the past, when I've thought of the gift of giving, it always tied to the tithing and giving your money to the church. Right. But I didn't see what, anything mentioned in the scriptures that I was reading that talked about giving through the church with the gift of giving. What you see actually undermines one -on -one. it undermines the way we give because guess what we don't give correctly okay here we go and y'all those of y'all been in class with me a long time know where i come from on this because i i don't see anywhere there's nowhere in the scripture where the new testament church is told to tithe all the tithe means is a tenth it just means a tenth and uh, israel 
Old Testament was to tithe, and they had three tithes, one that was given, uh, two that were given every year, then one that was given every three years. And it was for the temple and for the service of God, for their nation, okay? So it's effectively their tax rate was 23%. That's what that was. And that's where you have tithes and offerings. What you read, particularly out of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, is so, so, so important. Because the way that we're supposed to give, we're to give proportionally. We're to give joyously. We're to give as each man is determined in his own heart. Where does the tithe come off of that, you know? I think a lot of times people are to give more than 10%, but we lock them into a 10% type of thing. And he tells them, now, I think we're to give regularly. That's what Paul was dealing. He says, hey, you promised to give to help the saints down there. I'm sending somebody up there. So make sure that you lay aside every week to have it ready. Okay, that's just the wisdom of that. But really, when you see how we're supposed to give regularly, it's entirely different than what we teach and what we communicate. Aside from the supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit to give according to what he says and when he says, you know, in the same way that leadership is more than just a hired gun, giving is a lot more than money. You give a time, you give of life. Yes, you give of resources. But the giving is what the Holy Spirit is leading us to. Let me see what Carol said here. What about uh, this time of being unable to go to your local church? What if you are getting more blessings from someone online than anyone from your local church? Should we tithe to the online person or continue tithing to the local church? Okay, what do you say to that? That's a great question. Uh, people are asking that. You said it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. So how do you give related to your heart? Who's going to preach your funeral? I think you <laughs> Probably my son-in-law. <laughs> if you need to give to him, make sure you're covered. <laughs> I think that, you know, when, when I joined the Methodist Church, having been brought up a Baptist, the question I was asked, will you support the church for your time, your talent, your gifts, and your service? They mm -hmm. didn't say 10%. Right. Mm -mm. And, you know, I have a real problem when you look at a church budget and let's say it's $400,000 and they take in a million dollars and they've got 600,000 surplus. Oh, let's put that in the bank and let it draw interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, but if you're covering what a church needs to function, then I don't have a problem with going outside, let's Coleman caring for kids. Yeah, you know, Jay needs money to feed people. Uh, United Way, things where we know money is going into the community and is, is taking care of the needs. And it's doing what we can't do. We could, we could go volunteer and work for them, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I, I like the heart thing. And I like seeking the Lord. I like what Laura was saying right there. And what she's saying is this. And what you're all saying, Jim, you said, you said it's the same thing. Uh, where are you receiving from? You know, what, what's in, impacting you? And so uh, just me personally, I wind up breaking things up into small bites and pieces here and there. Uh, some of y'all are familiar with the Bible Project stuff. You know, send them a little bit. Every, every month I send them a little bit. Uh, send Heiser a little bit. Why would I send Heiser some stuff, Jim? Has that impacted my life? Absolutely. And, and because of you, it's impacted mine. Yeah, exactly. And so I do that. Uh, when, it's in there for money. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, Lene and Aaron's church, what you were saying a while ago. You know, uh, do you think you might want to support something that your kids doing it? <laughs> I actually, I support the ones that where I really receive from. And where I see God doing something. If I, what you're describing, Jim, boy, that's highly accurate. So many things. I, I don't feel called to support that too much when they're sitting there holding their own cards, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so Jan, let's say, I agree, Jan, that giving and tithing are different. Did Jan say that? Uh, I don't think the spiritual gift of giving has anything to do with it. Uh, okay, here's tithing is not uh, to be applied to the New Testament church. A lot of people think it is. You'll hear the word tithing. I go, yeah, yeah, I know what they mean a lot of times. But it's, it's just not there. You're taking something from the, that God required from the nation of Israel. To me, it's the same thing as the dietary laws. 
you're applying something like that to the church and that's not to be applied to the church. Uh, we're to give, we're to give hilariously, we're to give joyously. Uh, and then, but there's some that are empowered to give. Uh, Laura Ray and I can sit here and fire off a half a dozen names of some of our best friends that the Lord has gifted with the ability to give. And I'm talking about financially. And the more they give, the more they get. Now, Laura Ray may not have been gifted that way financially, though God has taken care of her. She's gifted uh, through green beans. And so I know if I need some green beans, I know where to go. And I'm dead serious about that. And she's giving me green green beans out of the abundance of your supply, right? That's right. Is that, but to me, that's such, that's, that's such a picture of how we're supposed to live. And not only a picture of that, I mean, that's the reality of it. We want to say, well, green beans, that's not important. Let me tell you what, if you're faithful with the green beans, God's going to trust you with the other things, you know? And so uh, I think that um, that if we if we uh, it taught things right, that's, to me, that's the big thing. I, I, this just keeps going through my mind, even with the world. If we can't be faithful and learning the truths out of the scripture and applying the truths correctly and properly if we can't do that with small things then why would the world want to listen to us with big things you know let me see what people are saying here i agree jan's time yeah what about luke 3 1 it basically says that we only need one tunic so what do you say about that any of y'all got more than one tunic we if have only had, if i only had one when it was day, when it was washing day i'd have to stay home <laughs> there you go what'd you say laura that we have too much stuff here. Yeah, sometimes we have too much. Uh, the Lord is was telling them, hey guys, don't pack up for all this kind of thing. Just trust me on this, okay? Trust me on this. There's nothing wrong with having abundance, but what does the scripture teach? The reason that we have abundance in anything, and abundance is simply one more than we need, folks. The reason that we have abundance is to meet the needs of others beginning with the household of faith. Well, I will and tell the, you this, if you would, yes. every one of you go live in 400 or less square feet for five years, actually for more like 15 years, you don't have abundance of anything. Right. And that you learn what you have to, what you really need to live with and what you don't. Yeah. And I can honestly say that that was a great learning curve in my life. But I want to go back to Carol's comment because I think yes. we have, we have all said good things and we've all said right things, but I don't think we've actually helped Carol. Which one? With, I'm assuming that she has this struggle when she was talking about, do I still need to be tithing, giving to my church? And she made yes. the comment that, that the church I belong to, that before COVID, they were very faithful and serving. And since COVID and she said, because of my husband's health issues, uh, that the church hasn't even contacted or hasn't done anything. So do I need to continue to, to um, support my local church? And I guess I'm sitting here thinking about that from the perspective of being on staff at a, at a local church. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I would tell you is that if your church has not reached out to you in over a year, knowing that your husband has helped these issues and everything else, then I would personally be looking for another church home because I think that says a lot about your church but if you think your church is really doing things for the lord and they are seeing people saved and they are ministering in their community then i think you have an obligation to continue to support that group but if um if it's a very uncaring church and they're not taking care of their flock i would be looking for another one yeah and there's also seasonal things I mean, I've known situations where somebody was very proud of how much money they gave to the church and they were very faithful, okay? And yet their mother was on public assistance. What do you think, Laura? I saw your face, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. You take Who care. should we? You take care of your family. You take care of your family. Okay, you take care of your family. Again, the, sort of the way I was raised, you put all of your seed and you only had one seed like in a row. You put everything in one place. I have more of a broadcasting mindset now <laughs> that, that that seed, you can plant that seed all over the place here and there, but you take care. So you may be going through a season to where, and I think we've really done a disservice in teaching the word of God and, and helping the body of Christ. 
because we come across, particularly out of my background again, to where you have to give this amount, this percentage. If you really, you have to do this and you have to do this. And then they'll haul people up and say, well, God blessed me because I did this. Well, then that starts a wrong form of motivation. You start giving because God's going to bless you. And that leads you down a wrong path, right? Rather than understanding, Lord, what is it you want me to give? And right now you may be able to give whatever it is. Then later on, it may be more. Right now, you may be able to give more, but later on, it may be less. God knows all this, folks. See, it's not like he needs us. Remember what Paul says? Hey, Paul says, <laughs> yeah, he says, you know what? I, I, I thank the Lord for the gift you give me, not because of the gift that I needed it, but because of what's coming to you because you're faithful. That should be the attitude. And so, and you know, you look at these things, you look at the gift of leadership, you look at administrations, you look at giving, and you think that they're, oh, these are simple. We all understand these things. <laughs> do we really? And then even beyond understanding, do we really apply them properly and live them out as the body of Christ? And, and how different would it be if we, with the giving thing, if we were to give the way we're supposed to? I tell you where it's led us. Because the church hasn't had the proper understanding about this, we have allowed governmental entities come and usurp, and we have abdicated our responsibility. And governmental entities are more than well, uh, more than desiring to come and usurp this because then they have power over people, and we have just abdicated it, what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, I think it's redeemable. I think God can do anything with it, but I think that uh, uh, we're wasting time if we don't start doing something. So, uh, Carol, seek the Lord. Uh, as to what he would have you to do because you do want to be supportive of people you love you do understand that you know the electric bill still comes you you, you understand i tell you what man you got to pay for those ministers of music they're outrageously expensive <laughs> yeah you got to take care of them you know <laughs> sometimes you got to laugh folks you know but you do you you, you say god what are you wanting and I, I i'll close with this when we uh started a little church in south florida uh me and Uncle Ronnie, <laughs> the church I was telling you about a while ago, uh, we realized we wanted to give, but we weren't locked into having to give. The other churches we've been in, you have to give this percentage here, this percentage there, this percentage everywhere else. So in Southern Baptist circles, it was Southern, this over here. Uh, and the Methodist circles, uh, what's it called, Jim? Hilda uh, apportionment, is that what it is? Uh, there, there's these things that you're required oh, to give and all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, we didn't, yeah, we didn't have any of this. And so let me tell you, the leadership, we had more fun. And that's the exact term, fun. It, it is sort of like a franchise fee there, Rachel. <coughs> we had more fun and just giving. And so one week we sent, uh, we sent money to Precept because we were being blessed by their resources. The next week, we may send money to David Wilkinson because we were being blessed by his preaching. You know, and then and we had a little thing of about six or seven places that we were just being blessed by, and we would just send the money. And there That's was such I a there was such a joy in doing that. I mean, we actually had fun in doing that. You know, when's the last time we had people as a body as a whole had fun in blessing other people and helping to meet needs? So uh, anyway, well, hey, our time's up. Anybody else have things you want to share or questions you have? Uh, the great thing about this course again is we can hit things as we go along, you know. Uh, I do know that uh, several, I'm looking here, if not all of y'all, from what I have experienced and what I've seen, uh, that the Lord has moved within his spirit within these gifts right here, okay, within these gifts. And uh, I thank the Lord for that. So, Father, I pray that you will continue to uh, <coughs> release your giftedness within leadership, administration, and giving within this group right here. Uh, Lord, I see it happen day in and day out where somebody will be administrating right here in a particular little thing. And we don't call it that. We don't acknowledge it. That, that's what it is. And I thank you for it. Lord, I do pray for these things that we've just been seeing through the weeks and the years of how uh, that we as your body, Lord, we just need to do things the way that you tell us to do it. And Lord, I pray that our heart would be more and more desirous of doing that. And that, Lord, you give us an opportunity to do that. And all the things that sometimes we fear about that, or how people might receive things or how things might happen, that you'll just take care of all that. And that, Lord, we'll just walk in your might and your power. Um, Lord, again, what, what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, in, that he came not only in word, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in full 
conviction. Lord, that's how we want to live. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank y'all so much. Hey, take this stuff. Reflect upon it. Yeah, turn your camera on. We can say love, love one another here. I'll turn on my floating head again. There we go. <laughs> So good to see everybody. There's Jan. There's Donna. Hey, those of y'all local, pass the word. Hey, Kimmy, uh, we aren't going to meet tomorrow, the Tuesday morning class and the Tuesday night class. And so uh, I'm going to send out a note right now to everybody. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a mess out here in the morning. So we'll see what's going on. But God bless each one of you. Uh, y'all love everybody. <laughs> Amen. Love one another. Good. Good. Love y'all. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'll check your note here in a second, Jan. I saw it pop up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.